All right, so this is now chapter nine of the Wreck of the Titan, with lucid intervals, during which he replenished or rebuilt the fire, cooked the bear meat, and fed and dressed the wounds of the child. This delirium lasted three days. His suffering was intense. His arm, the seat of throbbing pain, had swollen to twice the natural size, while his side prevented him taking a full breath voluntarily. He had paid no attention to his own hurts, and it was either the vigor of the constitution that years of dissipating had not impaired, or some anti-febrile property of bear meat, or the absence of the exciting whiskey that won the battle. He rekindled the fire with the last match on the evening of the third day, and looked around the darkening horizon, sane but feeble in body and mind. If a, if a sail had appeared in the interim, he had not seen it. Nor was there one in sight now. Too weak to climb the slope, he returned to the boat, where the child, exhausted from fruitless crying, was now sleeping. His unskillful and rather heroic manner of wrapping it up to protect it from the cold had, no doubt, contributed largely to the closing of its wounds by forcibly keeping it still, though it must have added to its present sufferings. He looked for a moment on the wan, tear-stained little face, with its fringe of tangled curls peeping above the wrappings of canvas and stooping painfully down kissed it softly, but the kiss awakened it, and it cried for its mother. He could not soothe it, nor could he try, and with a formless, wordless curse against destiny welling up from his heart, he left it and sat down on the wreckage at some distance away. "'We'll very likely get well,' he mused gloomily, "'unless I let the fire go out. "'What then?' We can't last longer than the berg, and not much longer than the bear. We must be out of the tracks. We were about 900 miles out when we struck, and the current sticks to the fog belt here. About west-southwest, but that's the surface water. These deep fellows have currents of their own. There's no fog. We must be to the southward of the belt, between the lanes. They'll run their boats in the other lane after this, I think. The money-grabbing wretches curse them if they've drowned her. Curse them with their watertight compartments and their logging of the lookouts. Twenty-four boats for three thousand people lashed down with tarred gripe lashings. Thirty men to clear them away and not an axe on the boat deck or a sheath knife on a man. Could she have got away? If they got that boat down, they might have taken her from the steps, and the mate knew I had her child, he would tell her. Her name must be Myra, too. It was her voice I heard in that dream. That was hashish. I think that's a type of drug. What did they drug me for? But the whiskey was all right. It's all done now, unless I get ashore, but will I? The moon rose above the castellating structure to the left, flooding the icy beach with ashen gray light, sparkling in a thousand points from the cascades, streams and grippling pools throwing into blackest shadow the gullies and hollows, and bringing to his mind, in spite of the weird beauty of the scene, a crushing sense of loneliness, of littleness as though the vast pile of inorganic desolation which held him was of far greater importance than himself and all the hopes, plans, and fears of his lifetime. The child had cried itself to sleep again, and he paced up and down the ice. Up there, he said moodily, looking into the sky, where a few stars shone faintly in the flood from the moon. Up there somewhere, I don't know just where, but somewhere up above is the Christian's heaven. Up there is their God, who has placed Myra's child here, their God, their good God, whom they borrowed from the savage, bloodthirsty race that invented him. And down below us, somewhere again, is their hell and their bad God, whom they invented themselves. 
and they give us our choice, heaven or hell. It is not so, not so. The great mystery is not solved. The human heart is not helped in this way. No good, merciful God created this world or its conditions. Whatever may be the nature of the cause at work beyond our mental vision, one fact is indubitably proven, that the qualities of mercy, goodness, justice play no part in the governing scheme. And yet, they say the core of all religions on earth is belief in this. Is it? Or is it the cowardly human fear of the unknown that impels the savage mother to throw her babe to the crocodile, that impels the civilized man to endow churches, and has kept in existence from the beginning a class of soothsayers, medicine men, priests, and clergymen, all living in the hopes and fears excited by themselves? And people pray, millions of them, and claim they are answered. Are they? Was ever supplication sent into that sky by troubled humanity answered or even heard? Who knows? They pray for rain and sunshine, and both come in time. They pray for health and success, and both are but natural in the marching of events. This is not evidence. But they say that they know by spiritual uplifting that they are heard and comforted and answered it at, at that moment. Is not this a physiological experiment? Would they not feel equally tranquil if they repeated the multiplication table or boxed the compass? Millions have believed this, that prayers are answered, and these millions have prayed to different gods. Were they all wrong or all right? Would a tentative prayer be listened to, admitting that the Bibles and Korans and Vedas are misleading and unreliable, may there not be an unseen, unknowing being who knows my heart, who is watching me now? If so, this being gave me my reason, which doubts him, and on him is the responsibility. And would this being, if he existed, overlook a defect, for which I am not to blame, and listen to a prayer from me? based on the mere chance that I might be mistaken. Can an unbeliever, in the full strength of his reasoning powers, come to such trouble that he can no longer stand alone, but must cry for help to an imagined power? Can such time come to a sane man, to me? He looked at the dark line of vacant horizon. It was seven miles away. New York was 900. The moon in the east, over 200,000, and the stars above any number of billions. He was alone, with a sleeping child, a dead bear, and the unknown. He walked softly to the boat and looked at the little one for a moment, then raising his head, he whispered, For you, Myra. Sinking to his knees, the atheist lifted his eyes to the heavens, and with his feeble voice, and the fervor born of helplessness prayed to the God that he denied. He begged for the life of the waif in his care, for the safety of the mother, so needful to the little one, and for the courage and strength to do his part to bring them together. But beyond the appeal for help in the service of others, not one word or expressed thought of his prayer included himself as a beneficiary. So much for pride. As he rose to his feet, the flying jib of a bark appeared around the corner of ice to the right of the beach, and a moment later the whole moonlit fabric came into view, wafted along by a faint westerly air not half a mile away. He sprang to the fire, forgetting his pain, and throwing on wood made a blaze. He hailed in a frenzy of excitement, Bark ahoy! Bark ahoy! Take us off! And a deep-toned answer came across the water. Wake up, Myra, he cried as he lifted the child. Wake up, we're going away. We're going to Mama, she asked, with no symptoms of crying. Yes, we're going to Mama now, that is, he added to himself if that clause in the prayer is considered. Fifteen minutes later, as he watched the approach of a white quarter boat, 
he muttered, That bark was there half a mile back in this wind before I thought of praying. Is that prayer answered? Is she safe? End of chapter 9. I don't know what to say at the end of that chapter. That was intense. I really do enjoy these little soliloquies and the character development that they bring about. It's very well written. This is a. It actually is. Yeah, it's, it's a good book. I didn't think it was gonna be at the beginning. Well, it's goofy at the beginning because yeah. there's there's so much. His character interactions, the author's character interactions, are silly. Yeah. That could be a result of the time. That could just be 1898, although I did read plenty of books from the 1880s, 1890s, 1900s, and sometimes they are like that. Sometimes they do have this very simple tone to the way they interact with each other. Sometimes they don't, but his own narrations, particularly when the character of Roland is narrating to himself, are very well written, exploring his deeper thoughts his hypocrisies and his character flaws, as well as some of his strengths. So, it's very... Those are well written. Yeah. Those are the best, even above the, the simple narrative of the story. But now we're halfway through the book. The ship is gone, and he's saved. What happens next? <laughs> 